Welcome, Doctor Academy. Um, hello. Hello. Thank you for joining us today for this interview on Trauma Networks. Can I just ask your full name and your position, please? Yeah, my name's uh, Andrew Academy, consultant at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, working in critical care floor. Uh, so I'm an intensivist and an anaesthetist. Uh, I also work as a consultant with the Emergency Medical Retrieval Service, which is part of ScotStar, or Scottish Specialist Transport and Retrieval, under the ambulance service, and we're based out at the airport. So I'm one of the consultants with that team and currently lead clinician. Lovely. And can you tell us more about the EMRS and your role as clinical lead? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so the Emergency Medical Retrieval Service, or EMRS, been going 15 years now. Um, we've just recently celebrated, just this weekend, 15 years of EMRS. And it was a service kind of established and pioneered by a group of consultants in emergency medicine and critical care in the west of Scotland. And they recognised that some patients who were being transferred in by the air ambulance service had needs, critical care needs, that were just unable to be met by the con configuration of the service and that those patients would be benefited by a advanced medical team going out to retrieve those patients and stabilise them and make them safe for transport before bringing them back to definitive care um, back in hospital. So it was set up as a, as a remote and rural critical care retrieval service uh, for those patients to help improve their outcomes and received a lot of uh, government funding to develop the funding to develop that after a voluntary phase where these dedicated consultants gave their own time to do it and then from 2008 which is when I joined the service we were given some money by the Scottish Government to explore it more formally and see if uh, we could demonstrate improvement in patient outcomes. That was a successful pilot and more money followed and it was rolled out to all of Scotland uh, and then now indeed there's a, a, there's a north team as well which covers the north of the country and a west team that covers uh, the, the kind of uh, the west coast and the islands and up to the outer Hebrides. And in addition to providing remote and rural critical care, we also now have recognised that there are other patients who have been isolated not so much by their geography but by the severity of their injuries, uh, where provision of pre-hospital critical care uh, to the level of an intensive care unit or a hospital resuscitation room will benefit those patients. And so now part of our job is pre-hospital critical care. And we very much have uh, a place right at the heart of the Scottish Trauma Network as it evolves uh, towards completion. Okay, lovely. Um, can you tell us what team members are involved in the EMRS service provision? Um, yeah, the EMRS team, uh, we've got about 27, 28 consultants as part of the team in the West. Uh, there's a team of 10 consultants in the North. Um, the West is obviously the team I know best because that's where I'm lead clinician. Uh, we've got eight retrieval practitioners who are from a diverse background of um, either paramedics or emergency medicine nursing who have been trained up and upskilled to work closely with us as a second team member. Uh, and we have two registrars at any one time who are in training in either emergency medicine or anaesthetics or intensive care medicine. Uh, who work with us. So if we deploy uh, to any kind of job, be it a pre-hospital emergency response, uh, maybe to a traumatised patient, or to go and retrieve a remote and rural patient, the core team is a two-person team with a consultant uh, and a second team member who is either one of our uh, retrieval practitioners or one of our registrars, and that's our core team that we deploy with. Sometimes the team is augmented, and if we respond by helicopter, for instance, to a pre-hospital trauma job, or indeed to remote and rural, then uh, we have the uh, uh, benefit of being deploying with the air wing paramedics who work on the helicopter and when we arrive at a scene um, it's very useful to arrive sometimes with a four person team and that can really bring a considerable resource to, uh, to look after patients who've been injured or, or indeed stabilising patients in remote, remote and rural contexts. Okay, excellent. Um, can you describe a bit more about your role as clinical lead? Uh, yeah, sure. So that's a relatively new role for me and uh, one where I've had quite big shoes to fill. The, my predecessor, uh, Stephen Hearns, was one of the original volunteer consultants and has s helped with colleagues steer the service to where it is today as a, an established part of healthcare in Scotland. So I've sort of taken over, at least in the West, from their role, but, uh, and I guess the role now is, is something different, and I guess it could be divided into two 
facet really. One would be management, which is perhaps a little bit humdrum and mundane and is about just making sure we've got enough people to do the job, that the sessions are filled, planning the road, so looking after job planning, that sort of thing, and, and troubleshooting uh, and steering day-to-day -day management of a, of a service and all, all, that, all that that entails. Uh, but there's also a leadership element to it as well, which uh, for me is, is of equal if not greater importance, which is about kind of leading a team of, of people. I'm very fortunate that the people who do it are very dedicated and passionate about what they do. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great team to lead, but looking after that team and making sure that they, they stay happy in the role uh, is really important. But also kind of horizon scanning and just seeing what the direction of the service is uh, and offering some leadership and protection of, of, of all the good things of what we do so that we don't get kind of that, that doesn't get consumed with by other considerations at a more strategic level and, and kind of seeing that we've got a place to bring good quality and excellence in, in clinical care uh, within the ambulance service within the health service as a whole and just see where the future is for that and offer some leadership in that regard yeah sure wonderful and you had some examples for us of some just to talk a maybe a little bit in general about the trauma networks. I mean, there's obviously a history and there's political drivers and there's an evidence base behind it. And that's what drove the establishment of the regional trauma networks in England. And I guess in Scotland, because of our devolved health service and for other reasons and unique geography, our evolution of, of regional trauma networks is, is kind of lagged behind is, is maybe too negative a word, but is by necessity kind of had to follow on in that regard. And I guess the drivers for it are twofold. One is centralisation, and there was a recognition, particularly in England, that there was a bit of variation with regard to how much, how well patients with major trauma were being treated according to where they presented. And that, that variation was actually of an unacceptable degree. Uh, and then if we centralise services into a sort of hub and spoke model, and focus those patients with major trauma into centres that would gain greater experience, that the trauma care would, one, be more consistent, and two, that consistency would be at a higher standard. And I guess it stands to reason that the more you do of something within a service, a personal level or an organisational level, the better you get at it. Or at least there's opportunity to be better at it, as long as the right resources are put into the quality and excellence side of the equation. Um, so that centralisation is one facet of it. And the other, the other facet of trauma networks, I think, is, is integration of services. These are patients who have a condition which transcends specialty boundaries. Mm -hmm. It's a multi-specialty, multi multi-specialty, multi multi multidisciplinary condition. And I've always felt that patients presenting with any condition, be it severe sepsis or multi-trauma, it's really not of interest to them that they have a condition that requires the input of one particular medical specialty and another medical specialty and that we're not really organized that well generally in the health service for disciplines to collaborate together around one patient. It's something we have to do in kind of a kind of micro level in intensive care all the time which is bring multi specialties around our patients uh, to collaborate and integrate and rationalize their care across their specialties but it's not something that's done well organizationally. And because of the needs of these patients, a network approach with uh, centralised services, but also a coordinated, integrated service that brings multiple specialties and subspecialties together and deliver an integra integrated approach to patient care is, is the other kind of main driver of, of producing the, of, of implementing the trauma networks. Thank you. Uh, so as an example of how things work. Now, the Scottish Trauma Network obviously is not yet fully operational in Scotland. That said, um, the hospital that we're in at the moment, which is not yet live, the, the West is the, the last region to go live as part of the Scottish Trauma Network, mm -hmm. really because it's the more complicated region. It's the, it's the one with the, uh, the greatest number of hospitals, the greatest population. So it's better that we get the, uh, the other areas up and running and test and, yeah, and sure. learn, uh, tweak the other aspects of the service before we roll up. But that said, here at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, we do have the specialties on site for, for managing these patients and historically we've always seen a, a great deal of trauma in, in, uh, in this hospital mm -hmm. partly because of the close links with the uh, aeromedical side of the, the air ambulance service and emergency medical retrieval service. So, so though we're not formally designated as a major trauma centre, we're kind of functioning at that level 
already pending the organisation and the input of the uh, injection of resources into the service. Again, from working in the Queen Elizabeth and in my role in emergency medical retrieval service, I can see how trauma networks are going to be of benefit to the patients. And a recent example would have been demonstrated both angles of things in terms of getting things right for the patient. So one of the aspects of care that you need to bring in is moving away from this idea that the ambulance service picks up a patient and takes the patient always to the nearest hospital. It's an element that we as the Emergency Medical Retrieval Service have always brought as part of our package of benefits to patients, which is, as experienced clinicians, we can diagnose patients to uh, an advanced level and triage them appropriately to the destination and take them to that destination. But that's not something that operates right down the level to, to the ambulance service. Obviously, we're, we, we deal with a very small patient group compared to the wider ambulance service. And so, uh, identifying a way of, ident of picking up patients with major trauma and making sure that they go directly to major trauma centres is a big key part of implementing this a trauma network. So there's a major trauma triage tool which will be rolled out and has been rolled out in the regions that have gone live, which have, uh, allows ambulance crews to examine a patient, um, look at things like their physiology, their injuries, the mechanism of injury, and use that tool in conjunction with telephone advice from a clinician based at Ambulance Control Centre to work out where the most appropriate patient, place for that patient to go is. So they'll look at patients and identify whether they need to go to a major trauma centre or whether they go to a trauma unit or whether they can just go as before to the nearest hospital. And some of the elements of that uh, are to do with, particularly in Scotland, are going to be particularly important. So. Um, uh, if you're major trauma positive, then you would, by preference, go to a major trauma centre. But if you're more than 45 minutes away from a major trauma centre, then you go to your nearest trauma unit, which are the smaller hospitals which are geared up to dealing with these patients, but are not obviously, don't have all the services on site that the major trauma centre would have. And it's likely that those patients would get initially stabilised and then transferred in to the major trauma centre. And it's a way of just kind of balancing the needs of getting the patient to the right destination, but also recognising that some patients have time critical issues that need to be resolved and managed by a, a unit nearer to that patient. So there's all those kind of elements, and particularly with our geography in Scotland, that's going to be quite challenging. And the pre-hospital side of things is really important to get right. And the Emergency Medical Retrieval Service, with its pre-hospital critical care role as part of what the ambulance service call the, the red team response, is a fundamental part of that, critical part of that. So recently we were tasked to a patient who was situated in the Highlands, a good long, long way away from, from anywhere really, uh, really quite remote. Um, it was an interesting job from our service point of view in that it was at night, which always makes things very challenging, and the weather was not very good. So this patient had driven the car at speed, had come off the road and impacted with a tree and they were entrapped. And Entrapment is one of the indications to deploy a critical care team in case they need advanced support in, in order to relieve the entrapment um, and also as an indicator of likely severe injuries as well. So we were tasked by the trauma desk clinician who had seen the call on the 999 call, had vetted it, seen the information and deemed that that kind of advanced level of response was going to be required. So we were tasked, but we weren't the only team that were tasked. There's an organisation called BASICS which kind of brings together doctors who are maybe GPs or work in rural environments but have undergo training and gain experience in being comfortable in the pre-hospital environment looking after patients. Now obviously they're not the same as a critical care team, they don't bring everything that we can bring in terms of capacity to provide anaesthesia or blood transfusion, that sort of thing, but they can do more. So because of the remote location, essentially a basics team was tasked to the location as well, in addition to the responding ambulance crews, local ambulance crews, and the fire service. And so there was a kind of multi-agency response to this incident. Uh, we took our time getting there because of the weather, and we had to go up with the Coast Guard helicopter, who came up and picked us up from Prestwick. And by the time we arrived, the patient was, had still been, had been trapped for the best part of three hours. But I'm very pleased to say that because of this integrated response, the basics doctors and the local paramedic crews had worked very closely with the fire service and when they'd arrived and been able to identify the clinical priorities and work with the fire service to get the patient out, the patient was already out into the ambulance when we arrived, which was great. And they were already doing 
uh, some of the essential care, which was putting splints on potential pelvic fracture and femoral fractures and that sort of thing. Now, interestingly, this patient, because of where they presented, their nearest hospital would have been a community hospital, a rural community hospital, which, because of where they were, was actually staffed by rural emergency practitioners who are skilled to a very high degree, but they're generally from a general practitioner background. And it certainly is never going to be a trauma unit, so it's never going to have on-site surgical resources or capacities for scanning and that sort of thing that a trauma unit would have had. The next nearest hospital was a trauma unit, but that would have been certainly longer than 45 minutes away in and of itself, which totally falls out of side the scope of even the major trauma triage tool. And a major trauma centre by road would have been you know, two hours drive away, something like that. So what we were able to bring to the scene as, a, as an arriving team, even though the, the, the basics team, the yellow teams, had done a really great job and actually, in terms of clinical interventions, had done everything that was required for that patient, because we carry blood and the capacity to look after the patient to quite a high level and our familiarity with working on aeromedical platforms, we were able to then convey that patient, not to the local community hospital, not even to a trauma unit, but in a timely fashion to a major trauma centre where they were able to immediately get the care. They were created by a trauma unit, a trauma response team. Didn't require immediate surgery, but did have complex orthopaedic injuries, crossing subspecialty boundaries. Uh, they were admitted to the critical care floor here. And this is where the integration side of things, so we've, we've dealt with the centralisation things, now the integration thing starts to come to as well. And within a few days, there was a coherent plan to manage the lower limb fractures, to manage the pelvic fractures, and to fix the spinal fractures that were there. And within kind of 10 to 14 days, that patient was actually entering the rehabilitation phase of their, their illness, which I think is an extraordinary demonstration of all the facets of a trauma network working really well together for the interests of the patient. And uh, I hope that patient does well, and I think uh, they've got the best chance to. And that's even before we're really uh, functioning as a proper trauma network in Scotland. Yeah. That's an amazing story.